Committee to address these challenging and important issues. Once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify and for the support of the subcommittee on these vital matters. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Birch and Mr. Tucker. I want to uh, acknowledge the presence of Congressman Elijah Cummings, who uh, a few years ago uh, opened up this uh, area of inquiry in the Congress and in his city of Baltimore is doing much to try to um, bring about uh, diversion from the criminal justice system into uh, uh, into rehabilitation. So I appreciate Mr. Cummings' presence here. But we're going to have the first round of questions. We'll probably have two rounds of, uh, of our panel. To both Mr. Birch and Mr. Tucker, the Conference of Chief Justices has advocated expanding drug court funding to $250 million and to distributing this funding to the states in a block grant program. Do you believe that the current evidence on drug court effectiveness warrants expanded funding, or do you believe that a block grant program is the best way to administer drug court grants? Mr. Birch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate the opportunity to address that question. Um, and uh, we've certainly met often with the Conference of Chief Justices and appreciate their support for the expansion of the, of the drug court uh, program. And we certainly have a lot of respect for their views and their input. And I know that they've shared with us some of their concerns about greater coordination of our efforts with the efforts in the state, and we'll certainly uh, continue to do that. Um, respectfully, however, we don't agree that a block grant program is the best way to administer these funds. Why not? Um, what we did this year, sir, after the uh, conference passed a resolution supporting this effort, um, we set aside some resources in the drug court grant program uh, to test this approach. And we offered for states to come in, apply for essentially a block of funding under the drug court grant program that they could then administer to local jurisdictions within their state. Uh, and to uh, our somewhat surprise, we only received six applications from around the country for that effort, hmm. uh, which demonstrates to us that, um, that this may not be the best way to go. Mr. Tucker, do you have a response to that? Well, uh, I would. Uh given my newness uh, to, the, to the office, but, but more importantly, um, deferring to, uh, to Mr. Um, Birch. Um, Mr. Kurlikowski, the number of times that he has come before us and talked with the chairman and myself and, and the full committee, we appreciate his work. Um, he said, Mr. Kurlikowski said in judiciary, Senate Judiciary hearing back in March of this year that in 2008, over 23 million Americans, 12 and older, needed treatment for some type of illicit drug or alcohol uh, use problem, but less than 10 percent received the necessary treatment for their respective disorder. Um, yesterday we learned in a hearing um, on the same general subject from Mr. Ford at GAO that in 10 years, um, because I asked him the question. I didn't know the answer. just asked the question. Uh, has GAO done any studies on how effective our treatment programs are? So, I mean, if you kind of cut to the chase, only 10 percent of the folks who have a problem are getting some kind of treatment, and we have no idea how effective the treatment is that that small percentage are actually receiving. Um, the, the, the folks who get, um, who are actually put in prison, how many of, how many of incarcerated individuals for a drug offense uh, in our prisons are getting um, some, type, some type of treatment. And I don't, we can, probably Mr. Tucker, I would assume, but we can go both of you. Sure. Well, I think, I don't think enough. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, um, but I think that's our challenge. I mean, I think that the, the data that you, that you have heard and, and from other sources suggests that we're, we're not doing enough. Uh, and so that's I think I think it gets us to the obvious question. I mean, if we're looking at alternatives to incarceration, that, that all makes sense if they're nonviolent and it's the best way to help people. I get that. Mm -hmm. But if, um, you know, if we're only getting to 10, 11, 12 percent of, I don't know, is that are we really going to go down that road? We're not we're not getting them. We, we have them there. We're not getting they're not getting treatment right now. 
Well, I think I think the the point is that we have to figure out how to do more. Clearly, we need to do do more, and I think we need to figure out how to do more, uh, both in terms of providing the resources and and to your point earlier, making sure that whatever treatment is provided uh, and however it's provided, that the vehicles that we use are effective, okay. and that the and we're getting uh, to the right population. Let me uh, okay, Mr. Burson, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up. Go ahead. As it relates to identifying children with those kinds of needs, I think we need to be more creative about how we do that. And one of the examples of that is we're training school resource officers now in how to identify children with those kinds of special needs and then link them up with the treatment that is available because it, that's often the issue at that age. Mm -hmm. and in terms of uh, residential treatment, I just want to uh, thank the Congress for uh, responding to the President's call to double the funding through the Residential Substance Abuse Treatment Program. We're now providing states $30 million a year, State Departments of Correction, to provide residential treatment for those who are incarcerated. And that's on top of our investments, thanks to Congress for responding with the Second Chance Act, $100 million that's made available to serve offenders and to get them uh, the treatment that they need. With respect to the, you know, to treatments that actually work for the percentage we are giving some treatment to, um, HHS Agency, Substance Abuse, Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, has stated that, quote, the beneficial role that faith and spirituality play in the prevention of drug and alcohol abuse and in programs designed to treat and promote recovery from substance abuse and mental disorders has long been acknowledged. Would, both, would both of you agree with that statement? Faith-based treatment is effective. Would, would you agree with that statement? I'm sorry. Would, would you agree with the statement that, and this is according to, to HH, this is according to SAMHSA, uh, has stated, and I'll read the quote again. The beneficial role that faith and spirituality play in the prevention of drug and alcohol abuse and in programs designed to treat and promote recovery from substance abuse and mental disorders has long been, been acknowledged. Would you agree with that statement? Actually, I'm not sure I understand the statement, but. I'll make it simple. The, do you believe that the, in, in the faith-based treatment programs, do you think they're effective in helping people deal with their drug and alcohol problem? I, th I think there are multiple um, ways in which treatment can be applied. And um, the question the was, do you think faith-based programs, this is according to HHS, they mm -hmm. seem to think so. Do you think so? Well, I think if, if, they, if they've tested it and, and they've had some success, I mean, I think treatment is delivered in a number of different modes uh, in different places around the country. And uh, if faith-based, if, if the organization happens to be a faith-based organization and their treatment modality,